Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to today's uh, webinar. Really pleased uh, that you're able to join us uh, in today's heat. Uh, and fortunately, this isn't a webinar about what's happening in Westminster. You'll be very pleased to know. But we've got some fantastic speakers from around the, the country who are really playing uh, in, in their own ways uh, incredible leading roles taking forward net zero in their towns, cities and regions. So this uh, webinar will go on till about 1.30. We may we may finish uh, a bit earlier. Uh, the webinar is, is called Turning Point. It's uh, about looking at the progress that has been made uh, around local net zero. And we have a fantastic lineup um, for you to, today. Uh, each of our speakers will be speaking for about five or so minutes. Uh, we then got some time for uh, questions uh, and asked answers afterwards. Um, and our panel panelists are uh, Dr. Karen Barras, who's the policy and research manager at UK 100. Mayor Tracy Brabin, Mayor of the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Councillor Richard Kluwer, who is leader of Wiltshire Council and Cabinet Member for Climate Change. Chris Skidmore, MP, Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for the Environment and recently a member of the Environmental Audit, elected as a member of the Environmental Audit Committee. Councillor Linda Taylor, leader of Cornwall Council. Kevin Guy, uh, Councillor Kevin Guy, leader of Bath and North East Somerset Council. And Mayor Andy Burnham, Mayor of Greater Manchester. So uh, I think you're in for a bit of a treat uh, over the next hour, hour and a half. Uh, and thank you again uh, for joining us. I just encourage anyone that's got any questions, please put them in the Q&A. We'd really like to have a lively question and answer uh, session uh, at the end. Uh, and I would just uh, like to hand over firstly to Dr. Karen Barras, Policy and Research Manager at UK 100. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to participate in today's uh, launch of the Local Net Zero Delivery Progress Reports and I hope to give you a snapshot of what's in the reports to set the scene for the discussion today. Um, it's quite hard to distill eight sector reports into five minutes uh, when they've been produced by examining over 100 strategy and policy documents, member surveys and captured the broad landscape changes that have happened over the past 12 months, so I'm not going to try. Uh, but I will urge you instead to read the reports uh, that you're interested in, or at least read the executive summary. Um, what I will share with you today are three key things that the research tells us about the journey to local net zero and how we can build on the insights to foster action and ramp up the pace and scale of the response. So my, my first thing is that things have moved on in the past 12 months. Um, the government has announced strategies or embedded into legislation commitments that progress towards net zero. Um, from the Transport Decarbonisation Plan, which celebrates its first birthday today, actually, uh, to the Energy Bill, which is but a week old, um, the government has set out a direction of travel. However, the details of the journey are, are still very unclear. In some areas, like energy, the fundamental role that local authorities need to play is still not being recognised by the government's plan, um, despite the Climate Change Committee highlighting in their progress report uh, earlier in the month that squandering the ambition of local authorities represents a significant risk to achieving the net zero target. In other areas, such as the net zero strategy, the heat and building strategy, and the transport decarbonisation plan, um, uh, these, these strategies acknowledged the need for place-based solutions crafted and implemented by local leaders like those that are uh, joining the call today. Um, that potential is, is vast. Uh, however, details on how this will be enabled by the national government is largely missing, um, as is support for delivery, which brings me to my second point. So across all of the sectors covered in the local net zero delivery progress reports, the need for long-term non-competitive funding was flagged as fundamental to moving forwards. Capacity and time spent for funding, uh, uh, sorry, spent applying for funding 
was flagged as a barrier to local net zero delivery. Effort and resources that could be better deployed more efficiently um, are used to submit applications with no guarantee of success. And I think the transport decarbonisation plan acknowledges that this has to change, but it's largely missing from other areas. Enabling local authorities to access private finance was also flagged across, across all of the reports as a significant priority. The development of the UK Infrastructure Bank is positive in this respect, and we look forward at UK 100 to building on the relationship we've established with the bank over the past 12 months as it develops its local lending capacity and its technical advisory support. But this transformational change needs new ways of thinking, new business models, new partnerships to leverage the long term cross sector patient capital that will enable the pace and scale of change that's needed. Um, there's much more I could say about this, but my final point really gets to the heart of what needs to change. And that's that we need to work more together. The member survey that we carried out as part of the research highlighted um, that a significant number of our members have spent the past 12 months working out within their local authorities what the route to net zero looks like through establishing strategies and plans, how their teams and their elected members can understand what net zero means for them so that they can help contribute to delivery. Uh, the government can and must do the same. Um, we welcome the announcement of the local net zero forum, something that UK 100 have been calling for in the net zero strategy. And we see the potential that it has to begin to foster some of the cross departmental and national to local relationships that will make a difference to delivery. But we need the roles and responsibilities to be made clear. We need more substance about how we move from declaration to delivery. And we need a delivery framework and a delivery unit to help us get there. So as the research shows, and again, I do urge you to have a look at it. Um, hopefully there's some useful information in there. There is a vast untapped potential for local authorities to go further and faster on net zero. We need the government to be uh, establishing uh, uh, floors for ambition and not ceilings. Um, and we look forward to working with our members uh, and, uh, and advocating that the new government harnesses this potential. Thanks, Jason. Great. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, and I just want to hand over now to Mayor Tracy Brabin, Mayor of the West Yorkshire Combined Authority, also co-president of UK 100 and chair of the M10 group of mayors. Over to you, Tracy. Thank you, Jason. And uh, thank you, Karen. That was really a uh, welcome introduction. And as Jason said, as one of the two co-presidents of UK 100, I'd like to thank everybody for being here today and to everybody watching at home and all the political leaders of all stripes here speaking, representing national and local government. Because we all know, don't we, that getting to net zero is absolutely above party politics. And polling has shown time and time again that that has over overwhelming public support. And if done right, it can absolutely deliver for everyone as well as the planet. And I know, of course, everybody's thinking about Westminster at the moment. And you might think that with all the drama, that this is the worst possible time to hold a press conference on anything, let alone something as important as net zero. But I'd argue, actually, this is the most important time. As recent days have shown, every day is getting hotter than the last. And the candidates currently vying to take the keys to number 10 need to take note, especially when some want to dump the 2050 target or scrap green levies, because we need government intervention and leadership. The cost of living crisis is the climate crisis. It's a failure of successive governments to invest in domestic clean energy. We need to immunise ourselves against global energy price spirals. It's a failure to build new green and affordable homes while retrofitting older ones. And it's a failure to work with local leaders, all of us ambitious for our communities to deliver on our net zero promises. And that's what's so good about this report. It will help us get to that better position. And of course, it's not too late. And it's reports like this that spell out not just the obstacles to net zero, but also the solutions. And I, I'm really grateful that they've put devolved powers and the role that local government needs to play at the center of this report. Because we know that more than half of the carbon reduction we need relies on people and businesses making local decisions. Because we're talking about buildings, we're talking transport, economy, waste, health, well-being. 
across all these areas and more. It's local government and local leaders that are going to make the difference. We are the tugboats that are pushing the big tankers of government into the correct position because top-down policies from Whitehall and Westminster can only get you so far. They simply won't work without the knowledge and the partnerships and the delivery that we can provide at that local level. In other words, we know how we can deliver best. So I really welcome UK 100's call for clear roles, for responsibilities and powers to be delineated between local and national government, identified um, as we heard in the opening remarks with that clear framework, with clear delivery streams from local to national and vice versa. Because at the minute we face a real challenge in fulfilling the role we know we can play, unnecessary barriers when it comes to capacity, when it comes to skills, finance, and perhaps more importantly, long-term funding. Now, I was hoping with many mayors that the leveling up white paper would have seized this opportunity, but unfortunately it was missed. What we needed was net zero to be absolutely embedded across government departments. And that's what I've been doing in West Yorkshire. We declared a climate emergency, published our climate and environment action plan, and weaved net zero delivery throughout my manifesto pledges. So pledges for a thousand well-paid, skilled green jobs for young people with already over 650 committed by employers, 5,000 new sustainable and affordable homes, 40 million pounds of our devolution money from government to decarbonize our economy. But of course, we know this isn't gonna be enough. We need government to provide powers, leadership and more funding. So UK 100 are calling for the Net Zero Forum to lay out in plain English, it's always useful, precisely how local and national bodies should work together with a clear framework for delivery supported by the, uh, the new Net Zero Delivery Unit. And I couldn't agree more because there are so many exciting opportunities for collaboration, opportunities for local areas to come together with all our projects and all our smarts to learn from each other, and grow real economies of scale. Now I know that we can work closer and smarter using the strengths and skills of each region to achieve our common ambitions. Because honestly, why reinvent the wheel when we can learn together, develop pilot programs together, reduce carbon emissions together. But for this to happen, government needs to support us. So over the last past year, I've consistently called for a better mechanism for providing funding to local areas, both on net zero and across the board. We absolutely need to end the beauty contests over funding, pitting areas against one another for small pots of short term funding. Why on earth should those of us on this call have to bid against each other for more EV charging points? or electric and hydrogen buses or money to transform public transport and get people out of their cars. Individual devolved long-term funding provides the best, most stable and most sustainable way to empower regions and address the climate emergency. But it's not just money. It's about devolved powers across transport, buildings, energy infrastructure and elsewhere. So we can pull all of our levers as high as they'll go. So the question is, what would these powers look like? Well, mayors could be the statutory consultees on energy regulatory reviews. We could have funding, flexibility powers, enabling us to have a bigger impact on our zero carbon ambitions. We could have strategic planning powers, especially over energy planning. So say we wanted to build a solar farm or introduce a new hydrogen or electric buses, then we need to be able to have the power infrastructure in place to do so. And there are so many things we could do. But finally, if I may, um, I'd just like to end with this. I'm sure many on this call will have seen those amazing images from NASA just the other day, countless, all those planets and galaxies and stars burning billions of light years away, seen for the very first time, um, just as they were 13 billion years ago. I just found it really moving and beautiful and scary, but it does remind us just how precarious life is, how precious our planet is, because it's all we've got and it's all that we'll pass to our children, our children's children. So it really is up to us as leaders now today, leaders of all parties, all levels of government to act now and to act together. 
because honestly, if we're going to get to net zero next decade, then, the, then this has to be the doing decade. So I'm really pleased to be here. I'm really proud to be the co-president and I'm really looking forward to everyone's questions. So thank you UK 100 for setting this up and for inviting me to speak today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tracy. Um, <clears throat> And a fantastic way to to end with that vision of uh, one one planet. Um, thank you. So over now to Councillor Richard Cluer, who's leader of Wiltshire Council and cabinet member for climate change, and also the other co-president of UK One Hundred. Over to you, Richard. Yes. So thank you, Jason. Uh, and. and Good morning to everyone, uh, or good afternoon, sorry, to everyone listening. Um, I ought to start by saying welcome to Wiltshire, but I would be slightly lying. I'm about 12 metres across the Hampshire border. Um, uh, I've been asked to, uh, to, to talk about nature. And as anyone from Wiltshire Council will, will tell you, uh, I tend to like some sort of historical reference or context when I start. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start in the past. Um, I, when I'm not, uh, well, in the rare moments of, of spare time I get, I, I like to look for fossils. My, uh, my, my favourites would be marine reptiles, ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs down at, at Charmouth, Lyme Regis. But my nearest beach, which is about 20 miles behind me, Fossil Beach, um, there are none of those. Sharks, teeth, a few turtles, things like that. And that's all because of the Cretaceous extinction. Uh, that's the asteroid that came, hit, wiped out the dinosaurs. That is not the biggest extinction our planet faced. The biggest one is what's called the Permian mass extinction, 251 million years ago. Now, scientific opinions vary there's a bit of debate but broadly we reckon the cause of that was massive volcanic eruption in what's called the siberian traps basically siberia was a volcano which set fire to huge coal seams and that in the course of about a thousand uh, ten thousand years increased the, the planet's temperature by about eight degrees um 90 percent we reckon of all species on earth died at that time there wasn't a tree left on the planet from what we can make out. There was no coal for, for many millions of years afterwards. Now, why is that relevant? Um, at the moment, we're heating up the planet more quickly, probably 10 times as quickly as happened during the Permian mass extinction. And we're doing so from a position where nature is already under significant stress. Our, the, the sheer scale of our population, of urbanization, of the intensive farming practices we need have already put nature under threat. Now, I don't want this to all seem doom and gloom. Uh, we've identified the problem. We know what it is. We can fix it. We can take steps to address uh, 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 and resolve the issue. But if climate is, if nature is going to respond to the issues of climate, um, we're going to need to give nature a helping hand from the position we've already put it in. Uh, and we don't want to underestimate this. I, uh, addressing this is addressing this whole issue of, of global warming is the defining factor, absolute defining factor of human existence in my in my opinion. Since we we created civilization, since we started farming. Now the Environment Act is a really good start to protecting nature. Um, we're looking at a co the combination of the need for nature recovery being embedded, being embedded in law, and then the issues and the need for biodiversity net gain. Um, vast opportunities there, but already we're seeing some pitfalls. Um, I've had a planning application in one of my villages where biodiversity net game was going to be delivered by putting a hedge. Uh, two fields would have been built on and a hedge would have been put between houses on three sides and a road on the other. That's not biodiversity net gain. That's not replacing the, the wetlands, which are also a very good carbon sink that would have been, been built on. Um, and, and not far from where I am now, about three miles, we've got a, a, a campsite. Uh, that under permitted development rights, the absurdity of planning law we're trying to get resolved, is in essence being converted into a village in the middle of the countryside, in the middle of the protected landscapes. And the, 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 the net gain argument there for putting in all these, these large trailers and the, all the hard standing um, is, is that they can deliver net gain there in the most protected landscapes in the UK. This is a national park. You don't get more protected. So we're going to have to watch developers really carefully in this process. As local authorities, we have got to make sure we get the right framework in place for nature recovery and for net gain. Now, the backdrop behind me and the reason I'm sitting out here is, is this is the new forest. Um, it's 23 miles behind me. You get down to the sea and there are two roads between here and there that animals cannot cross wherever they want. If you think about your traffic hierarchy in, in Manchester or Leeds, where pedestrians come first here, ponies come first. And this is a man-made landscape. 
it's here because, uh, well, if you ever ask what the Normans did for us, William the Conqueror said, I want somewhere to go hunting. And as a result, I'm now sitting in a vast bank of biodiversity net gain of nature, of, of a vast range of different habitats. Um, it's called a forest. You can see behind me, this bit's pretty open. That's because the animals roam free over it. They keep the trees down in some areas and other areas, areas you've got ancient forest land. But, but that means you get massive diversity of wildlife about, well, I won't say exactly where, but, but somewhere shortly behind me, um, if, if I took a, a bucket and went down with a net, I could fill a bucket up with newts, those things that we're so desperate to protect in planning, I could fill a bucket up, I reckon, in about five minutes. Um, there's that degree of, 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 of diversity. But if we're going to work, make this work across the country, we are going to need banks like this everywhere in perpetuity. And I don't mean the 30 year perpetuity of the Environment Bill, I mean properly in perpetuity and the stewardship of people who understand what it is to look after the environment. Our national parks, our areas of outstanding natural beauty, military training areas, the large land estates, uh, land owned by government, by councils, by all of us. Um, we're going to need these banks where nature can be left to get on with it. And then we're going to need corridors to link them up. Corridors that, that again are protected by people who are going to look after them properly, whether that be along roads and rivers with wild flowering, uh, with wildflower meadows, or, or other corridors that we can create. And then at the last, the micro level, we're going to need those small local nature preserves in our towns, in our cities, that give areas where again nature on the micro level can flourish, but we can get the bird life and the bee life and the wildlife back. We can't just leave it to developers and to make it. Um, to make this meaningfully developable, um, make this work meaningfully. Already, um, we're, we're looking at farmers who are, are looking at the profit margins they can get in here. And strangely enough, the, the most profitable way to do it, uh, to put land aside for net gain, is, is coniferous woodland. Now, for those of you who've walked through a coniferous wood, a pine wood, it's very nice, but it's actually, ecologically speaking, pretty much a desert because of the pine needles and the effect they have. Try walking through ancient oak woodland and, and the, the difference is vast. So we've got to make sure we, between us, can, can come up with, with systems and ways that are actually going to deliver proper net gain. I'm gathering a conference tomorrow in Wiltshire of, of stakeholders, including my AOMBs, National Park and so on, to look at how we actually do this and how we embed it into the planning system. Because as local authorities, we can set the planning rules, but we're going to need an awful lot of other people to step up and get involved to make it work. Um, the other issue there is it's, it's cross-border. As I said, I'm sitting just in Hampshire. New Forest has parts of, of, what, four local authorities in and two counties. None of my AONBs sit inside one county. Um, Kevin on the call uh, and I share parts of one. We're going to have to work together to create the infrastructure that nature needs. And I think in all this, we really need to remember, and building on what Tracy had said, nature is, is beyond politics. The newts behind me, they don't care about whatever our political issues of the day are. They don't care about what it, whether it's, it's Brexit, identity politics, immigration, cost of living. What they need is a place where we can have a long-term strategic plan to let them thrive, to let them be alone, to, 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 to grow, to live, to expand, to spread. It, it's a plan that's going to be over a time period where we're going to have more than one political party in power, uh, and we are going to have to work together to achieve that. Now, that, that sometimes sounds a little overly idealistic, but I don't think it is. I think when we're dealing with climate change and nature, it is a time for idealism. It's a time for grown up politics and to put the party politics aside on this issue and work together to actually make a real difference, not just for our children, but for thousands of years to come. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Richard. Um, so over now to Chris Skidmore, MP, uh, who is chair of the, uh, all party parliamentary group for the environment. Uh, over to you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Jason. Thanks to UK 100 for hosting this event. I'm uh, sorry that we couldn't meet uh, in, in person, and I hope that that will uh, shortly happen. Uh, as, as we know, you know, there's been a number of uh, events that have destabilised uh, both the political scene uh, and I think also the local authority scene when it comes to actually delivering on net zero. And I think one of the challenges for us sometimes is to be able to anticipate unknowable and uncertain events, to be able to plan for them and, and build into our strategies, you know, resilience and the opportunity to look ahead. 
And as Tracy said, you know, that opportunity to build resilience, to be able to plan in spite of adversity, can't be delivered uh, just at a national level. You do need local delivery partners on the ground who understand the unique circumstances, the unique geography, the new single local strategy towards net zero you know, will be different. And I know we've got about 102 local authorities who've declared their intention to go net zero. You know, sometimes I'm quite concerned about the timeframes they've, they've given themselves. That there might be a, a, a Dutch auction race downwards to trying to deliver too soon, uh, too quickly. You know, what's really important when it comes to the net zero target is that it's delivered effectively and that we don't lose public confidence in being able to deliver on net zero. So I think, and hopefully Andy you know, has heard this phrase before as a politician, always under promise and over deliver rather than over promise and under deliver. And that's what you know, we're all here today to discuss how that can happen. How do we not just sort of under promise, but how do we over deliver? For the future and i think you know, local authorities are very well placed you know silently working away they 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 always sort of you know uh, go beneath the radar but it, they often do over deliver and i think you know, when we look at what local authorities have achieved in the past by devolving certain strategies certain policy areas through the devolution powers that have been put in place uh, you know but not only when it comes to the the mayoralties you know, we are now seeing you know, an increased uh, advancement in the ability to be able to deliver on policies. I've long thought, for instance, when we've looked at waste and recycling, that being a local authority uh, responsibility has been able to create a framework where local authorities not just collaborate when they need to collaborate, you know, joining forces when they recognize economies of scale. They've been able to compete. And there's nothing wrong with competition when demonstrating actually you're a local authority who's got record levels of uh, waste recycling. I'm very proud that South Gloucestershire Council in my local area is third in the country for when it comes to, to recycling. And South Gloucestershire Council you know, is determined to go even further because they like to be in competition uh, with local authorities. So how do we generate you know, that sense of uh, friendly competition amongst local authorities, I think is really important. And I'm delighted that you know, when it comes to looking at um, heat and buildings, that you know, Wiltshire Council have had their energy efficiency program in place, which is aiming to get all council houses to EPC uh, level B within 10 years. You know, that's a commitment that Wiltshire Council has made, has gone out there, put their reputation on the line. And you know, it's that local innovation, local commitment that's so vital. But um, you know, I'm here to talk about heat and buildings. I think I would say when it came to net zero, which I signed into law three weeks ago, three years ago, sorry, last week, you know, if you told me that we'd have 90% of the Earth's land service now uh, signed up to a net zero target, I simply wouldn't have believed you. You have this enormous domino effect internationally, and the UK has demonstrated its international leadership on this. And uh, I've been determined in the Conservative Leadership Contest to make sure all candidates don't row back on that international leadership, which is so vital for us, given the, uh, what we did at COP26. But then also, if you told me you know, three years ago that we'd still be in a place where we don't really have made any progress at all on heat and buildings, um, again, you know, I would have been disappointed. And I just joined the Environmental Audit Committee. My first meeting yesterday was with the Committee on Climate Change. John Deben came to present. And his number one priority was recognising in the climate, Committee on Climate Change's latest report that they haven't, the government has not set out a credible pathway to decarbonising on uh, buildings and, and on heat. And actually, Chris Stark you know, has gone even further, I think, on Newsnight the other week to say, you know, it's a scandal that we've had 1.3 million new homes have been built or have been planning permission to be built. Uh, and yet these homes will need to be retrofitted uh, in the next 10 to 15 years in order to meet uh, actual energy efficiency obligations. And that's a cost that could have been put on the developer and on the land price, and instead it's now a cost that's directly being put on the consumer. And I think you know, in, in five to 10 years, we will look back on this, and it, it will be seen, as Chris Stark has said, uh, you know, as a scandal that should never have happened in the first place. You know, what can we do now, I think, to be able to deliver on future energy efficiency schemes? Obviously, I've been trying to protect the green levies, uh, but I think there still needs to be policy innovation beyond eco. Uh, I think as Tracy's mentioned, 
there is these two small pots of funding that then too many people are bidding into uh, these these pots then either become overwhelmed or they close. You know, the supply and demand is too un- unstable here. So how do you create a, a demand that is stable for the longer term? And how do you then, that, how does that then foster the supply? You know, we've got a huge skills agenda uh, that I think is being recognized in the mayor authorities in, in having a green skills agenda to actually provide the workforce that is going to be able to deliver on insulation, deliver on decarbonization. But at the same time, you know, we have other areas of decarbonization, such as the net zero industrial hubs and high net in the northwest. Uh, they came to see me um, just a week, ago, two weeks ago, and I, I went to see the chancellor on this particular issue because HiNet want to go further faster. Actually, our uh, hydrogen uh, targets that have been set out in the energy security strategy uh, have now doubled, but the industrial uh, decarbonisation hydrogen supply fund that has been set up by the treasury has not been doubled and uprated in return. And so HiNet are only being given the opportunity to produce one gigawatt of hydrogen and they can they need to double that in order to crowd in all the uh, uh, investment that's needed and, and ensure that it stacks up and is, is operational. And that's a local led uh, consortium uh, that is basically saying, look, we can go faster. Let's front load this investment. Let's get on with it. And actually being held back by the state and by the center. And you know, we've got to break out of this system by which heat and decarbonization doesn't sit around waiting for the government to open up its latest competition rounds. And we're not going to be able to achieve all of this with you know, the model of the contract for difference. It doesn't work when it comes to carbon capture, because ultimately these are products and markets that have yet to be properly matured and developed. So there is no profit margin that you can necessarily uh, set out within that contract for difference scheme. So we, you know, we do need to be innovative. And I think the other thing that was spoken about, and Tracy spoke about it, was the role of business here. So local authorities you know, and mayoral authorities can set the vision, can set the pathway. And I think, importantly, you know, set out different pathways depending on which local area and where they can prioritise, given which industries are in those particular areas. But at the same time, how can we ensure that the private sector within those local areas is able to deliver? And I think that's something we've got to really look at for the future. I think for myself, uh, actually creating more stable funds, mechanisms that aren't top down is, is really important. But also, how can we potentially look at uh, future offsetting for the future that will allow private investment to be able to offset uh, when it comes to local insulation? And I think there's a huge social value purpose uh, opportunity here that's being missed you know, at the moment for local companies, local private sector, within regions to be able to demonstrate their value within their local communities. And with that, I would say don't also ignore uh, other institutions that are regional institutions, such as universities. You're very keen to demonstrate they are civic universities. Yet at the moment, the university's opportunity to help innovation, to help drive through productivity and efficiency for local SMEs is being sort of left on the table when it comes to energy uh, yeah, it's almost like a separate conversation. I think they could be involved, uh, but they're not yet. So working towards you know, local authorities, mayoral authorities coming together with their leading institutions and private sector organizations and companies is absolutely vital, creating those consortia. I think you know, for me, the polling that was set out, I think, by you know, UK 100 today was really striking that 34% of those polled in local areas believe their best place to deliver on net zero 54% don't think they haven't got the adequate resources and 42% don't think they've got enough power. I think it's really important that you know, when it comes to the next phase of decarbonizing on heat and on buildings, we are not going to be able to do this simply by a government tweaking planning regulations. We've got to be able to look to create new agencies for delivery in order not just to under deliver, but I think you know, over deliver and over promise when it comes to actually you know, achieving our net zero ambitions. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Chris. And and also, I'm sure everyone would join me in thanking you for your leadership at the moment in Westminster for um, net zero and and of course the role you've played in the past. So thank you. Um, over now to Councillor Linda Taylor, uh, leader of Cornwall Council. Uh, and then after Linda, we've got Councillor Kevin Guy from Bath and Mayor Andy Burnham from Greater Manchester. So over to you, Linda. You need to take yourself off mute.
you would think um, I would have learned that by now. So um, good afternoon and welcome from a very, very sunny Cornwall. Uh, our contribution is going to be about energy. So as a local authority, we are redefining what place leadership looks like and our role within that. And the challenges that we face mean we simply cannot be passive. Along with working to half the emissions created from council operations over the course of the council's business plan, uh, that's 20, 22 to 26, we have built a strategic leadership coalition that provides a clear, measurable and deliverable set of actions that will ensure that Cornwall plays its part in delivering both national and international obligations. Um, as with any change on this scale, no one organisation can do this alone. And combating climate change needs system-wide change that involves government, communities, business, individuals, and stakeholders across all sectors of the economy. In Cornwall, we have focused on our role as a systems leader, aiming to ensure the projects we deliver are replicable and accessible for others to learn from. For example, making our nationally recognized development and decision-making tool available for other local authorities and communities to use. Um, and I would strongly recommend if you've not read uh, Kate Rainworth's Do Donut Economics, please do so. Since adopting our Climate Change Action Plan, the Council have led on a number of uh, innovative public and private partnerships to enable the decarbonisation of our energy system, including directly investing into deep thermal, geothermal, installing Cornwall's first wind turbine since 2016 in partnership with Centrico, and with our investments into biomethane, uh, capturing to create a renewable transport fuel on six car. Um, six council farms uh, with Benjamin, and uh, they are a very innovative Cornish uh, small business. Now, in case anyone's got confused, biomethane is cow's muck, and it's working incredibly well in Cornwall. We also own um, Celtic Sea Power, and this is actually an arms length uh, council company working to accelerate the industrialization of floating offshore wind, flow for short, and maximize the social economic benefits for the people businesses and communities and regions of the Celtic, uh, Celtic Sea region. Beyond this, our Climate Emergency Development Plan document aims to establish a planning policy to deliver our climate ambitions by allocating land for renewables and our solar framework is utilized to commission installations and support the local supply chain by increasing the pace and certainty of deployment, including a rooftop PV scheme of 600 council owned homes to help tackle fuel poverty. Uh, Cornwall generates 40% of its own electricity demand and the council now has a 10 uh, megawatt um, portfolio of uh, solo, I've just lost my notes, so apologies a minute. Um, we have, uh, we demand, we create 40% uh, of it of our electricity and we now have 10 megawatts portfolio of solo and wind that generates around 30% of its electricity demand with a commitment to install a further two megawatts per year. The accounts approved a 30 million renewable energy and low carbon technology investment fund that builds on our existing 16 million climate funds uh, to accelerate innovation and delivery of the climate action uh, plan. To support the ambition, the council will shortly start work to undertake a local area energy plan to produce the plan required to decarbonize its energy system. And in doing so, we will explore opportunities for the joint exploration of future local energy scenarios that can be used to establish credible pathways to net zero. And the outputs of this plan will be used to frame our ongoing dialogue with government, uh, providing a local evidence base for our, our district network operator to use as a base for their dialogue with Ofgem around investment into grid infrastructure and identify opportunities for future research and investment by the council and third parties. The role of the government. However, we know we have to access systems and partners to put in place the solutions and foundation for change to take place and for this to happen at pace. To this end, we continue our dialogue with government to meet its aim of Cornwall becoming the first net region area. 
To achieve this, we need to accelerate delivery and respond to Cornwall's strategic challenges through our county deal negotiations. For net year zero, this includes access to our long-term housing retrofit funding, piloting heat network legislation, and innovative approach to investing in our aging uh, electricity grid. Through this engagement with government, we have clearly articulated the challenges and opportunities offered by our drive towards net zero, which in turn will shape and define the nature of the conversations we have as local authorities with residents and businesses, because as I have hopefully made clear, only through strong public sector leadership can we create the conditions for residents, the private and third sectors to deliver the environmental, economic and social benefits to allow our communities to thrive and meet the UK's net zero commitments. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Linda, that was fantastic. Um, now over to Councillor Kevin Guy, uh, leader of Bath and North East Somerset Council. Thank you, Jason, and thank you, Linda. Um, I'll be talking about clean air, so I won't be mentioning too much about cow muck, so uh, I'll, I'll reduce on that one. Thank you, Linda, for covering that. Um, as we all know, the UK 100 has been focused on cleaner air for several years, and I welcome its report on the progress made at the local level in the past year and the actions that are needed now. I'm very proud that Bath and North East Somerset Council, along with many other ambitious authorities that are here today, have pledged to achieve net zero by 2030, ahead of the government's 2050 deadline. We have signed the UK 100 members pledge to act sooner and make substantial progress in the next 10 years. In Bath and North East Somerset, we are encouraging active travel in our journey to net zero plan, which aims to reduce the environmental impact of transport in Bath and tackle some of the biggest challenges our society faces including tackling climate change, improving air quality, improving health and well-being, and tackling congestion. Unfortunately, the current ways in which we travel will not get us to carbon neutrality by 2030. Journey to net zero sets out the changes needed to our transport system to great places which we live and work with better connection, healthier and generally sustainable communities. In Bath, we have placed people at the centre of the journey to net zero, focusing on improving transport, infrastructure and environments that will encourage us to have more sustainable modes of transport by making them genuinely alternatives to the car. In March, I'm very proud to say we introduced the first clean air zone outside of London. We have already seen significant improvements in air quality since its introduction. Whilst we have yet to receive a formal assessment from the Joint Air Quality Unit, our data shows that nitrogen dioxide concentrations in the zone have reduced by 21% since pre-COVID baseline year in 2019. And this is despite traffic flows in Bath largely returning to pre-pandemic levels in the middle of the year, and we have significant highway works going on in the city. You'll also be interested to know that air quality and traffic flows have been monitored outside of the zone to determine if the changes in traffic displacement have affected admissions there. But our findings show that nitrogen dioxide concentrations in the urban areas outside of the zone have reduced by 22% since 2019. This is because we received significant government support for people to upgrade their most polluting vehicles with cleaner ones. These new vehicles have improved air quality around the whole of the district and not just within the zone. With this in mind, I fully support the UK 100's request for the government to take a robust position with respect to setting targets for particular matter in pollution. As Tracy and others have already mentioned, clean air is a national problem that needs national action to enable locally designed solutions. But in many cases, local authorities do not have the powers to do what we want to do. We don't have the funding, we don't have the resources to tackle these huge challenges that we're all facing. So I'm sorry to say that air pollution is a health emergency the far reaching consequences of which are more obvious every day. In this recent assessment, the government's approach to tackling local air quality breaches, specifically focused on nitrogen oxide levels, NO2, the National Audit Office finds that while progress has been made, it has been slower than expected. The report also highlights concerns relating to particulate matter, such as dust, dirt, and soot. While responses to NO2, largely from road transport, are becoming more robust, more evidence on the impact of particulate 
matter demonstrates that urgent responses are needed to address the wide ranging sources of pollution. So it is clear we need to simultaneously working to deliver net zero and address the root causes of air pollution. Clean air zones appear to be focused on upgrading vehicles rather than ensuring there are particular alternatives to private vehicles, which in turn illustrates the increased value of bringing together clean air and net zero in initiatives. As I've already talked about, the relationship of the two is critical to getting to net zero plan. This is an example of how we are joining up the way to develop our policies to reach 2030 net zero targets and have cleaner air in Bath and North East Somerset. I was very pleased to sign the open letter to government pledging ambitious action on PM 2.5 air pollution and join the call on the UK to meet World Health Organization's air pollution standards by 2030 and not the government's 2050 target. The power and potential of local authorities to design and deliver real progression towards net zero against a global backdrop of unprecedented and far reaching challenges has never been more important. And I'm very, very looking forward to putting aside party politics and working with my fellow leaders and mayors in challenging air pollution. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Kevin. Really, really clear, thank you. Um, now, lastly, we have uh, Mayor Andy Burnham, a Mayor of Greater Manchester. Uh, over to you, Andy. Thanks, Jason. Uh, afternoon, everybody. I've been asked to talk to transport and uh, do it in five minutes, so I'll try and uh, stick to that. Uh, to allow time for, for questions. Um, we are, I think, in a unique position in Greater Manchester in that um, a decision uh, has been taken to put buses back under uh, public control. And because of that, um, I would say we are in a position to dictate the pace of decarbonisation on the public transport system in a way that perhaps other places are not uh, able to. Uh, and also, integrate our buses with um, bikes and trams in a, a London style public transport system, the B network. That is what we are on with building and we are very much now in the middle of the franchising uh, process. There is still an outstanding legal challenge, but if, if that can be dealt with, and we hope it will be, um, we are looking at uh, bringing in regulated services from, uh, from next year, uh, September, firstly in Wigan and Bolton and We've just placed an order for 50 um, electric buses to serve uh, the Wigan and Bolton area, which will make a very big difference. Um, and also, uh, I think as we move then towards a, a single tap in, tap out uh, system with a, a cap on what people can spend across the city region, we can sell a different way of moving around this place. At the moment, people are more dependent on their cars because of the cost of public transport. It's expensive if you uh, use a bus and then leave the bus and get on a tram because uh, people pay as a new customer. And until we can get that London uh, principle into cities outside of London, I think we, we will falter uh, on our path towards um, net zero, certainly as far as transport is concerned. Uh, as I say, when the public authorities control the nature of the vehicles on the road, um, the the, the, the journeys that they make, i.e. where the routes they take, um, and when uh, also the fares are controlled, then I think we can make public transport outside of London a much more attractive offer uh, than it is has been uh, certainly over the last few decades. Um, and um, that, I, I would say, is what we're on a mission to prove. We are going to move ahead of, uh, of time to um, introduce a flat two pound uh, adult fare from the 1st of September uh, and a one pound fare for under 16s. It'll be free for 16 to 18 year olds. But we believe a drive to reduce the cost of public transport is critical in this. We've been grateful for the uh, BSIP funding from the government, but it's very much a partnership. And I think this is the way it needs to be seen. It's not local areas doing it all on their own or national areas doing it all top down, as Tracy said. I, I think we've got to do this in partnership uh, if we're going to get the country uh, where it needs to be uh, by uh, by 2038 in our case uh, for net zero city region, but 2050 uh, as a country. So let me just flag a couple of risks to it. Firstly, on bus funding, uh, while we all, not all, many of us have had bus services improvement funding, not everywhere has. And at the same time, we haven't had the funding to uh, help bus services recover from the pandemic. 
there's still a shortfall in terms of the passenger numbers compared to pre-pandemic levels. We're at around 80 to 85% of bus passengers. And the government is saying there's no funding from October. So we may have a situation where funding is going into fares and frequency, and yet the services are being cut. And that is a real issue um, that the next uh, prime minister and cabinet need to address very quickly uh, indeed. Otherwise, we'll see public transport going backwards just at the time we're trying to improve it. The second thing I would point to would be rail transport. Our vision would be to bring rail into this V network vision. But at the moment, it's kind of stagnating. And I would say going backwards and uh, the rail industry is not moving fast enough at all. Um, and that needs to change. And one of the things we've been asking for as part of a negotiation with the government on the deepening of devolution powers uh, is devolved control of rail stations so that we can improve them, uh, certainly from a disability access point of view, but also build more homes around them on top of them, start building for public transport uh, rather than building for the car. And I will put it to this meeting today that the assets across England that are our rail stations are massively underused when it comes to regeneration and building for public transport rather than often where we're forced to go, which is building on uh, green sites that the public uh, don't support. So we need a vision for transport that is also about a vision for uh, uh, a, a, a public transport led recovery from COVID and a public transport led drive uh, to, uh, to net zero, where we sell people a fundamentally different way of moving around uh, this great country uh, of ours. And I just would say something on clean air, because as Kevin knows, we've had a very difficult debate here. Um, and you know, it's, it's not been easy at all. I, I think this points to this whole question of a just transition. I don't think we get the hearts and minds with us on, on the journey to net zero if it looks like it's all being done by with a big stick rather than carrots, give people incentives to make the right choices, you know, lower cost public transport, retrofit their homes so they get lower energy bills, you know, or in this case, grants to help them improve their vehicles rather than kind of made to do it via the threat of charges. There's a report out from the centre of cities today that says that the um, poor transport in the north means that car dependency is much higher here. And therefore, inflation is higher in the north because people are more trapped in, in road transport because of poor public transport. Uh, and they are simply not going to be, they can't afford to change their vehicles here in the same way that they can in other parts uh, of, of the country. And I think that has to be recognised, other, otherwise we won't get there. You know, we, we will end up with a, a level down country on the road to net zero, not a leveled up uh, north of England. And, and that's uh, hopefully something we all want to to avoid. So I'll leave it there, um, uh, Jason, but just to pick up the point Chris made, I, I, I personally think it is about under-promising, because I think if you under-promise, how do you get the hearts and minds with you? I think it is time, actually, to sell people a different vision of things going, going forward. And, uh, you know, in our case, a public transport system that is clean, uh, reliable and affordable, that is not over-promising. I think that's what people should have, in my view. People here should have what is expected uh, in London. Why not? Why can't people have that in Leeds as well? And in and in all the places on this call, Cornwall uh, as well. So let's have a, not over promise, but a fair promise. You know, parity across the country, parity in terms of the cost of public transport and the quality uh, of it, and then get delivery firing right behind it and hearts of minds pulling with that vision uh, because then people can see it's something worth, worth buying into. The, the drive to net zero, I think, is about hearts and minds from the bottom up, not as legislation from the top down, as Tracy uh, was saying. And, and I think that's what we're trying to do in Greater Manchester with our vision of a, a B network, which is a very different public transport system than the one we've got. We are on with it. The first regulated services will come in from the 17th of September next year. I would just say, you know, we're trying to do this in a way that provides a template for others to follow. Give everywhere in England the chance to re-regulate buses, let them set the pace of change, control the pace of change, uh, and then take the public with them. And that's what we're trying to do. And we hope our experience here will be a benefit to everybody around England uh, in the years to come. Thanks, Jason. Great. Thank you very much, Andy. That was fantastic. And thank you to all the, the speakers. Uh, really all, all fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we've got lots of questions uh, now. We'd like to have a period of, of q and I know both you, Andy, and you, Chris, have to leave uh, at one. So I'm going to 
have the first question with with you guys, perhaps you first, Chris, and then you, Andy, having the first um, brief response. So our first question is from Megan Kenyon from Local Government Chronicle. If the next prime minister elected to replace Boris Johnson waters down central government's net zero commitments, what would this mean for the hundreds of councils of all political persuasions that have made tackling the climate emergency a key priority? Well, I, I, I think that personally that they can't uh, afford to do so, both you know, locally, the framework's been put in place, uh, but also internationally. Um, and that's why I asked all the candidates at the 1922 hustings yesterday, will you commit to keeping the legislative framework in place by 2050? But the date's key, because if you move the date, it all collapses. You know, thousands of scientists have proved the pathway to 1.5 degrees is dependent on the 2050 date. Um, so we've had three of the main candidates out of the six commit to net zero by 2050. So that is Liz Truss, that is Rishi Sunak, that is Penny Mordaunt, all the others I think are going to be knocked out anyway at some stage, but sort of, a, um, so you know, we'll wait and see, but I think it's important to make sure we, we have this debate, because I think it's what's quite interesting to me is how few politicians think this is just a national target and don't understand what how far society, business and, and local authorities have moved in preparation, you know, for what needs to be achieved uh, and you know it's such a, a, an enormous challenge and it's 28 years away but if we don't start dealing with the, the difficult things now the hard to abate industrial sectors looking at the houses you know the houses that are being built today will still be lived in uh in in 2050 so it's really critical which is why i've gone out on a limb to, to make this an issue in the leadership contest great thank you chris uh, andy over to you uh, I, I want to echo what somebody else said before and pay uh, tribute to Chris for being a voice, actually. Uh, I've certainly noticed what Chris has said over the last week, and I think you know, many of us welcomed it. You know, it needed to be said and, you know, credit where it's due, Chris. Um, and it's good to hear what you've just reported back from those uh, those hustings. I think if I could, though, um, just put a challenge out to the Conservative Party. I know you like hearing th these kind of things from me. You always welcome my input. Um, but I've heard the candidates talking rightly about growth, prosperity, productivity. Why are they not making the connection between the drive to net zero? Because it will deliver all of those, all of those things. If you get the public transport system here of the kind that I described, that is the foundation for a more productive economy in Greater Manchester. Um, if you um, have a widespread retrofitting program, that's the route to prosperity for people. You know, thousands and thousands of good jobs can be created uh, through that uh, through that program. Eighty thousand actually net zero Northwest um, uh, predict. And, and I've been with the CBI and, and others this week who say, you know, it's net zero is the road is the route to growth. You know, that, this is where the world is going, and we need to be pioneering the new technologies that. Uh, can drive this growth. So in here in the Northwest, you know, we've got uh, amazing work coming out of the Liverpool city region on hydrogen, on tidal power. We're, we're working together with Steve Rotherham on, on all of that. So it, this is really important that this argument is, is won in this period of time. You know, this is the route to the, the nation's future, pr high, uh, highly productive, uh, highly prosperous, growing, uh, growing economy. This is the future. And we must not turn our backs on it at this point in time. But it is also finally, Jason, the route to levelling up. You know, if you retrofit homes, if you improve public transport in the way that I've described, you know, you will lower energy bills, you will lower the cost of public transport, you will lower the cost of living for people, as well as improving people's uh, communities. I, I found it odd, as Tracy said, that the levelling up white paper had barely a mention, if, if any mention of net zero. I mean, that, there was a very big disconnect going on in central government there. These, these are two sides of the same coin. Net zero is the catalyst to a leveled up country. It's the way you move quickly, improving homes and transport and jobs right across, right across the country. So these arguments, I think, need to be won. And Chris, I hope you become less of a lone voice uh, and more of a you know, kind of leading uh, what is, becomes a common consensus that you know, this is actually where the country goes or should be going now to get the regional growth and the prosperity and the productivity that we need to see. Great. Thank you, Andy and Chris. And I, I, am I right in thinking you both need to go uh, now at one, don't you? 
I've got to go off and vote. So yeah, I, 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 I literally otherwise I'll, I'll be sort of one of those who sort of get, take, don't take part. And you know, people will certainly be like, why didn't Skidmore vote? Was it a protest against Net Zero? So I better go off and uh, make sure I put my mark in the right ballot box. But I'm only voting for a candidate who backs Net Zero. So thank you very much, Chris, and thank you, Andy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. So Thanks, we have about uh, another 20 or 25 minutes or so for Q&A. Uh, we've still got some fantastic uh, speakers. Um, I'd like to move on to another uh, question now and put it out to the to the panel. This is a question from Rosie McGlynn. Um, should the delivery of energy efficiency programmes and low carbon technology be devolved to local authorities and uh, uh, an attached question to that, how can private finance uh, be encouraged to support deploying such programs? So perhaps if I start with you, Tracy, uh, and then go to you, Richard, Linda, Kevin. Um, uh, thanks ever so much, Jason. And thank you, Rosie, for that question. I mean, I would, I would suggest building on my opening remarks and also what you've heard from Andy and Chris is that that local power, we understand where our need is and we should be given that authority and the resources to deliver. So when it comes to energy efficiency, um, of course, if we can um, support companies to, as we are doing with our Rebiz program, supporting companies to get more energy efficient, and uh, then their savings, which is tens of thousands of pounds on their bills, I'm suggesting we have a program green for good so that they then uh, bring back those savings and pay people the real living wage as part of my fair work charter. So it's not just about what we're doing for the planet, but it's also about the inclusive growth. And to Andy's point, absolutely, I say this on many occasions, that levelling up and tackling the climate emergency are two sides of that same coin. So that would um, that energy efficiency is really important, whether that's also about uh, insulation, whether that's about talking to businesses, uh, about what they can do and also our local authorities of course are big procurers and where, where what more can they do um, and private finance absolutely we've been given 200 million um, to start uh, the work for mass transit we're the only Leeds is the only city in Europe without a mass transit network it's part of the um, uh, Conservative Party manifesto and we are uh, hoping to start this 10-year project which is a two billion pound project and what it will do is it will have that interconnectivity that will um, uh, uh, connect to buses and cycle routes etc and trains stations and etc but we can't do that alone uh, because it's a massive infrastructure project so I'm pleased the infrastructure bank are here in Leeds but it is also about bringing on partners who are going to be um, uh, helpful. So the big insurers, the pension pots, the uh, uh, big companies that can can make the you know invest in the in the actual substance of a mass transit. We really need to work in partnership and collaborate and cooperate with others and get best practice from elsewhere. But. There is a, that pesky problem of green finance, and I think um, you know there there is a bit of a struggle there trying to understand how businesses can get more involved when it's so they have to be so patient um, on the outcomes and the reward for that investment that could be decades and decades in the future. Now, um, in in Europe and Scandinavia, there are companies that will wait you know, uh, or, or Japan, there are companies that were, are prepared with deep pockets to make that investment, knowing that it's going to be quite some time. So it's also about trying to work with businesses to encourage them to have that patient finance and investment in local government. Great, thank you, Tracy. Now over to you, uh, uh, Richard, from a particularly rural um, uh, per perspective, uh, around energy efficiency uh, and whether whether those kind of um, technologies and, and the opportunity to deliver them should be more devolved to local authorities. Yes, thanks. I mean, 
they've absolutely got to be devolved. I would love to see the, the, the look on the face of a civil servant when, when a minister told them, right, go on, retrofit the, the UK. Um, because Westminster's not geared up for that, and local authorities are. And the issues are, uh, that, that we'll all face are completely different. The issues that Tracy will face um, in the urban areas in Leeds are completely different to the issues that, that I'll face uh, in, in my bit of the New Forest, where, where the housing stock's totally different, the current heating systems are completely different. The, there's also the issue about how local delivery works, because uh, for me, if you want to register a house in, in much of Wiltshire at the moment, good luck, because there isn't an industry, there isn't a skill set to do it. We're trying to build it as a council, which is why we're retrofitting our own housing stock. But but we need to train that up in a way that in Manchester or Leeds, then you, you, you may not to uh, not need to because you've got a greater bulk of population and perhaps a greater simplicity. Also, when you're looking at things like the private rental sector uh, and particularly housing association and um, council housing stock, again, uh, central government isn't going to sort that. It's got to be done through local authorities. There are very few areas in the delivery of, of progress on climate change that are not best covered on a local area because of the complete variation in the way we need to respond. Could I just jump in, Jason, on that point? I think yeah, that's a really, a really excellent point because we have 300,000 homes that could be um, uh, up for retrofitting and businesses that potentially could deliver and young people who could learn those skills. But unfortunately, because we don't have that guidance from government about where government are going to go, whether that's hydrogen, whether that's, um, you know, whether that's ground source heat pumps, there is a nervousness in the sector about, you know, putting all your eggs in one basket. So we do need um, that, that clarity. And even if government say it's gonna be both, then we know we can we can encourage um, with the adult education budget. We can encourage the skills training businesses to get them, you know, really up and running. Now we've got a pilot. We've got about thirteen hundred homes that are currently um, uh, underway for retrofit, and we're making that decision. We're using um uh my uh climate money the you know part of that 40 million that i spoke about but but we do need leadership at the center so that then we can just get on and deliver because in when it's a market economy you're not going to get businesses who are going to go for one specific thing and just cross the fingers and hope that that market's going to appear yeah thank you tracy um so um any uh can I hand over to Kevin now? And yeah, then... yeah, no, I'm happy to add to that. I, I, I fully agree with, with what Tracy and Richard have said. It, central government doesn't really have the ability to do this. Bath is a prime example. We have, we have hundreds of grade one and two listed buildings and the skill set to retrofit those sort of buildings is very unique. And we don't, we don't have that within the UK at the moment. So we need to develop that skill base locally and we can implement that as a local authority. And that could be replicated in many other our World Heritage sites, and Grey One Two of There's a huge amount of energy lost through these buildings. There's a stupid regulations on on keeping uh, sash windows looking gorgeous in Bath, but they they kick out loads of heat. So on, only through giving us powers locally can we actually tackle these issues. So I fully support what Tracy and Richard have said. Great, thank you, Kevin. Linda, thank you. Um, the, the remark that Andy made about net zero is the road to growth. Here in Cornwall, we actually think net zero is the road to turbocharging our economy. Uh, we are very lucky in Cornwall because we've got lithium, we've got geothermal, and only within the last um, 10 days, Hexagon uh, had the first uh, floating wind uh, government award. Uh, so there's huge potential. Uh, We've got to be absolutely developing our green skills because I believe that these are going to be the high tech uh, value jobs for the future. And the point that's been made by Kevin about uh, some of our planning restrictions on uh, listed building and conservation in Cornwall, um, many of our buildings are in conservation areas and, and they're granite. And, and these are very expensive uh, properties to, to retrofit, but there are some things that we can do, but planning actually stops uh, the use of those innovative ideas. So, um, and the other thing I would say about uh, devolution is we are pursuing a county deal here in Cornwall because we firmly believe 
that we are local. We know what's needed to be done. And the other point I think, Tracy, you made right at the very start about why are we all fighting for pots? We shouldn't. You know, the money should just be devolved down. We get on it, get on with it. We spend it. We know what's needed in our local area. And for me, I actually see uh, net zero as an exciting prospect for, for absolutely turbocharging our economy. And I'd go so far as to say with our, our natural reserves of geothermal and lithium, we are looking to help the rest of the UK. Thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, I just want to turn to a question now from uh, Alec Peachy from Transport and, and Energy, um, uh, which is how do we progress the removal of any silos to ensure that the transition to clean transport and energy is not slowed down in any way? And of course, we all know that nationally uh, and in some senses regionally and locally there there uh, um uh there are in some cases lack of links so how do we ensure that these um silos are, are removed tracy over to you first yeah well it's exactly what we're talking about isn't it is is bring the power and authority to local government. And I've said several times to ministers and whoever will listen, it's going to be so much more straightforward. We can deliver faster if Treasury just give us a pot of money that we can then deliver on what, what is needed for our region, rather than having to go to different departments, different ministers. Ministers might have their own um, uh, interests or... As you know, with the um, current situation with the jostling for position for the leader of the Conservative Party, people are distracted. Um, you know, politics gets in the way and actually holds us back when we want to deliver. There's now a pause in, in and a concern that the things that we're waiting for from government are going to be delayed, sign off of the City Region Sustainable Transport Settlement, nearly 900 million. We're, we're, we're continuing at risk because we don't want to wait for government because they are um, slightly ground to a halt um, of the, uh, the last few months. So it doesn't make sense that DFT doesn't necessarily talk to Bayes, doesn't necessarily talk to Treasury. Surely it makes sense. In the same way as mayor, I have portfolios of housing, transport, skills, um, business, and actually I'm the police and crime commissioner as well, so police and crime over one umbrella, and I can have a Venn diagram of deliver delivery. And every, every strand, every work stream, is speeded up by that that fact that it's all in one um, one pot, so to speak. So I do think that the 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 structure where some powers are held by the centre and given piecemeal to the local leaders is holding us back. And those silos definitely, I would say, don't have the the communication needed to be agile to have creative problem solving, light on their feet, cross-referencing. People do feel very much in, in their lane. And I think we need to get rid of all those swimming lane indicators and have an open pool where we can just get on with the job. Great, thank you, Tracy. So I just um, want to move on because um, we do have quite a few questions, uh, but I think this next one is, uh, is focused on some of those kind of trade-offs or or some of those choices that that you you guys as uh, as pioneers and uh, leading uh, local leaders face. So this is from Louise Marix Evans, uh, and firstly, perhaps for you, Richard, but then we can go around. What what trade-offs do you face at the moment, balancing short-term decisions and the route to net zero? This is, of course, in the context that we need courageous leadership and that can be difficult in light of co the cost of living crisis, fuel costs and the need for housing, etc. There are far too many. Um, if I start with housing, um, I, I was saying that, that, that we, when I was talking earlier, that we need to look at a, a, a different approach, a, a more a long term joint approach. And some of that's not going to be comfortable. Housing at the moment, the approach is that we build houses 
broadly on greenfield sites on the edge of settlements because that's the cheapest place to build houses and then we get government housing targets that are for the country but they're spread around primarily from from um, rural areas particularly in the the, the, the south and midlands um, and so we get unsustainable elements of housing that, um, uh, 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 as was, was, was also pointed out, are built to this insanity of not being net zero today. So they're, they're all in need of retrofitting. Um, when you then try and balance that with the need to protect nature, the need to um, ensure that we've got enough local food production, um, to then look at renewable energy generation, that, that creates a, a, an awful trade-off. So somewhere, I think it would be really good if all of us could get together and agree that actually we're going to have to do more brownfield developments and we're going to have to do more higher density, better designed developments, not poorly designed ones, in more urban areas. Or we're going to have to accept that we're going to continue to, to build all over the countryside and, and damage nature. Um, Trade-offs on transport. Tr Tracy was raising a lot of points there about transport. And, and, and again, the, 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 the issue about buses decarbonizing rural transport is simply not the same as decarbonizing urban transport in wiltshire my economy is absolutely reliant on the car so decarbonization of transport is going to require require the decarbonization of cars rural buses they're an aspiration i traveled back from harrogate from the lga conference um last week and, and i checked when i was setting off in my car it would have taken me 11 hours 57 minutes to get home by train and bus because there simply is no bus after six o'clock from Salisbury. So it, we've got these, re these real tensions and they're only gonna be fixed at a local level yeah. and government's got to stop giving us targets that are based on whatever their, their London or, 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 or whatever their, their simple view is. They've got to say, this is the direction of travel. How do you achieve it? And how do you make it work in your areas? Great, thank you, Richard. And, and a, a long way from, uh, London, uh, down in Cornwall, Linda, you, you guys are making real headway uh, towards net zero. So what are some of the trade-offs that, that you're finding or some of the challenges and opportunities? We've got a real housing crisis, actually, in Cornwall. Uh, 22,000 people on the housing register, over 1,000 people in emergency accommodation. Um, I absolutely think we need to be thinking different about the uh, aspiration to own the house. Uh, I want to be able to deliver out more passive council housing uh, it, and give that security so that people have got that roof over their heads. I absolutely think we need to be looking more at modular housing uh, and absolutely change the mindset of what, what people think they, sh they should have. We are delivering on modular housing in Cornwall because it's, it's move on, it's really quick. And, uh, and it is sustainable. So, you know, I, I really think we need to be doing more there. I'm going to say something controversial, actually, now. Um, Robert Jenrick's uh, planning bill, uh, sort of about a year and a half ago, part of it was something I particularly liked. And that would have been the ability of the local authority to identify growth, renewal and protect. And those areas would have been determined by your local community. And so at a glance, any developer coming in would see exactly where they could focus their, their development. And it would absolutely then save countless arguments from developers about wanting to go into the protect um, areas. And that was something I, I'm, I was really, um, it was a shame that that got, to, got dropped. Because for me, that was a really imaginative way to control your planning. Um, Brownfield site remediation, we absolutely need the fund, especially for us here in Cornwall as well. It's that mining remediation. Uh, Wales are very lucky. They've had that um, significant funding. Us in Cornwall, as I'm sure in other areas where there's mining, we need that investment here because then it means that we are using the land that's already been used in the past, bringing it back for, for current living purposes or for industrial use and then absolutely protect um, our areas uh, of outstanding natural beauty and also uh, stop making our towns and villages bigger uh, to accommodate housing numbers. You know, different investment into, into areas like the Brownfield sites. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And um, Kevin, just before I bring you in, because I'd really like to hear about uh, trade-offs or opportunities and challenges you're seizing in Bath and, uh, and North East Somerset. 
But we have a, a question that is related to that and specifically for you uh, as well from uh, Fadel uh, Tukuri. Uh, in view of the impact of pollution on health, how do we reconnect the green agenda with the health agenda um, and um, particularly around climate and net zero, uh, clean air and net zero? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, and we're working very closely with the the NHS uh, locally and both universities uh, to encompass their huge minds on how we challenge this ridiculously difficult question. Uh, one thing we get accused of in Bath when we're trying to tackle these these bigger issues is being anti-car, um, and and it's not about being anti-car. It's about giving people um, choices and more sustainable choices. So if you if you what Tracy mentioned earlier, if you, if you try and stop people working in silos, you get people to start working together, get the bus services, the train services, uh, the local authority, we all, we all start working as one rather than in, in completely different silos and hardly them ever, ever talk to each other, then you'll be able to give people proper sustainable choices rather than getting in the car to do the short journeys they're doing. About 40% of journeys within Bath are between one and two miles um, are, are done on the school runs as well. So it's about giving people the alternative to do those school runs, that's a huge challenge we face locally. Uh, and how very small city, very compact city, how do we get people out of their cars and give them the alternative choice? That is, that is the main uh, difficulties we're finding in the city of Bath. And, that's, and I'm sure that's um, copied around the country. Uh, the government need to give us the powers to tackle that locally, but at the moment we haven't got that. But bus services work completely different to local authorities. For some reason they think that we're in charge of them. We're, we're not, exactly like Richard said, if you were in charge locally, you would provide a Salisbury service for, for people after six o'clock. Uh, and, and it would run at a, a loss to us as an authority, but we do that because there's an environmental need to do that. Um, with regards to air quality itself, our roads are at capacity at the moment. Uh, and I mentioned very briefly in my speech about there are other things like soot and dust that come off the road. Uh, and that is because of the amount of vehicles that are going over it. And unless we find alternatives to cars itself, doesn't matter if we make them all electric, we're still going to get that poor air quality kicked up by that movement of transport. And that's why we need to work very, very closely with our health authorities and incorporate our brilliant universities and the great minds they've got there and how to give us alternative solutions to give people uh, um, alternative ways of getting to where they need to get to. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we've got a question uh, specifically for you, Tracy, uh, here from Saeed Ahmed. Um, shouldn't the M10 group of Metro mayors, the, the group that you chair, um, be shouting out louder for national government to be pushing policies around area-wide retrofit, distributed energy generation and local climate adaptation? Thank you very much, Jason. And Said, um, uh, you're absolutely right that there is power in the M10, we represent over 20 million people um, and have money and authority to get things done. And um, we are a voice to government and we do speak to ministers, uh, obviously not at the moment, everything's slightly parked, uh, but we do speak to ministers and we do write letters collectively, uh, particularly um, one recent win was the bus recovery uh, grant was going to end a few months ago and we are all very clear that that cliff edge would mean we would lose a spectacular number of routes that would impact on mm. our uh, uh, zero carbon targets by uh, in in our region by 2038 because we we definitely wouldn't be able to get people back on the bus so we wrote collectively and we got an extension unfortunately like groundhog day we're back there again looking at an October uh, cliff edge and trying to make the case um, yet again. But collectively we are, we are tight on this and it doesn't feel party political. Um, certainly Andy Street, the Conservative Mayor in the West Midlands and myself and, and others working collectively on this agenda. And you'll know that uh, Sadiq Khan is the chair of C40 uh, leading on the climate, climate change as well. So we do have power and we do have authority, um, but uh, both um, Sadiq and myself think, for example, when it comes to procurement, we could be smarter, that we could procure electric buses 
uh, in greater numbers to, to um, be then divvied across the mayoralities and maybe save costs that way. Um, also, um, to we, we talked together about transport and you heard Andy uh, Burnham talking about that east-west transport. You know, you will not tackle the climate emergency unless you have a rail network that works for the public and and you can't force people out of their car unless you have an alternative because otherwise they're going to lose their job or will have to walk because there are no bus routes and no trains to get them to where they need to be so it is um it is a powerful group um it is a a, a respected voice to government mm. but there is a slight hiatus at the moment until it's all shaken down but that is definitely the case that we're making. And in fact, I would like uh, Patrick, Sir Patrick Valance to come and give his um, presentation on the slides um, that he did for MPs to really give us that overview. And it was hugely disappointing. There were only 70 members of parliament um, at that presentation, but um, it, it's a really good point. And I take my role as chair very seriously to draw people together with that in that common endeavor. Just muted, Jason. Sorry, sorry. Uh... Uh, I thought I'd be able to get away with one of these without uh, making that mistake. Sorry. Um, thank you, Tracy. Now, uh, just I think we've got time for two very quick questions now. One to you, Richard, if you can answer quickly, which is from Nick Rosen from offgrid.net, who wants to ask you, does the uh, Countryside Climate Network that you chair for, for UK 100 or any of its members support large scale development of low impact off grid eco housing in the open countryside? Gosh, good question. I, I, I certainly couldn't couldn't speak for everyone. Um, I do. I think I think it's fair to say that we would support the, the need for continued um, building around, particularly if when you're dealing with issues around transport and, and sustainability around villages. Um, and it's got to be zero carbon. Um, the reason that, that that's got to be supported is that some of our villages are classed as unsustainable by current planning, but they'll never be sustainable and the village schools will end up closing and people will only end up traveling further and you won't have a shop unless you put some housing in there, particularly council housing at social rent, because it is so, so expensive to live in many of, of, of our villages. So, I mean, on the micro level, absolutely. On the macro level, I think it, it's very much going to be site specific. There are definitely arguments that you can use that it is a, that, that there are areas where, where you need to see more housing. Um, the MOD and the, 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 what I'm hearing from, for example, Tidworth um, with the super garrison is they want to see more facility and therefore more housing around it. And grid capacity is a serious problem in that part of the county. So off grid would be a really good way of looking at it, but it, it's going to be really place specific. I think what we don't want to see is a, a system that just allows this continual developers charter to engineer five year land supply um, issues in rural areas. And, and they are pretty much engineered um, that then mean we end up seeing cookie cutter developments built in places we don't want to see built on uh, of unsustainable housing. So yeah, but it's a balance. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, and it seems we're now at one thirty. You've had the final word, uh, and I'd just like to bring things to a close uh, and just thank our excellent panelists. And I'm sure you're all, everyone listening, will join me in thanking um, thanking them for their time and their excellent presentation, Linda, Kevin. Richard, Tracy, and your explanation, Karen, of our research. So thank you and for your leadership on Net Zero in your regions and, and nationally. Uh, I'd just like to remind everyone that we will uh, we are sharing questions. Um, there's a sign up in the chat if you want to have a look at any questions that didn't get asked. Or, or answers of apologies. We did have a waterfall of, uh, in the end of questions, lots of interest. Thank you everyone to uh, coming along today. I'd encourage everyone to sign up to UK 100's newsletter. We have a summit that we are um, uh, hosting in partnership with West Yorkshire Combined Authority on the 3rd of November. You can sign up 
um, to listen in uh, or be be a part of that um, on the UK 100 website. And thank you again to, to everyone and our panellists uh, and enjoy the sun. Thank you very much. Bye.